This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs. Join the discussion on IIEA.com and access our engaging videos, blogs and podcasts. Welcome to the Institute. Um, can I first ask, if possible, if you could turn off your mobile phones or certainly turn them on to silent. Just check my own now, make sure I've done that. And um, in the normal way, the, the um, speech is on the record and the questions, in case they get a bit deep, will be off the record or non-attributable. We're very, very lucky today to have this young woman here beside me. Um, Maura is a Professor of International Security in Dublin City University. And um, she is a coordinator of something called VoxPol, an EU-funded project on violent online political extremism. And we were saying to her downstairs that of all days for her to be here after what has happened over the last three days, uh, with regard to the internet and, and what is being labelled as cyber crime. Um, we are lucky that today we have her here and you may want to ask some. In my view, there are some quite simple questions I have to ask about these things because I don't understand them terribly well, you know, how they get in to do the things they do. But she, is, um, she has participated in um, main researches on terrorism and the internet, uh, academic and media discourses on cyber terrorism, the functioning and effectiveness of violent political extremism online, and violent online radicalism. Um, she is really a major expert in this area, and um, she's she's fascinating to listen to. I have to say, in the short time that we we had um, some time to talk downstairs, and what she's going to talk to us today about is the. The online strategy that's being used, the Islamic online strategy, and the way it can grow and maybe contract and then come out again in a different form. So I know that the audience here looking around at it are all people who have a big interest in this, and they will challenge you, I'd say, with some of their questions, but I know you'll be able to answer them. So yeah, like Nora said, I, I'm responsible uh, for a project that's uh, EU-funded about violent online political extremism. Uh, very often, I guess, people say terrorism and the internet. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today, in fact. What I'm going to talk about is the so-called Islamic State's uh, online strategy. Uh, and in particular, I guess, what I want to talk about first is, okay, what's, what's the problem, if you like? So what's their purpose uh, in terms of what they're doing online? Um, and then I'll talk about, um, I'm going to call them IS. I'm going to call them Islamic State. Uh, people call them Daesh. They call them ISIL. They call them ISIS. They call them various other things. I'm going to say IS. We can talk in the Q&A if anybody uh, uh, has uh, questions or uh, their own perspective on that. Um, but yes, yeah, so uh, secondly, what I want to do is talk about so-called Islamic states, IS's online activity, in particular at the kind of the height of their powers, if you like, in around 2014, 2015. And then I'll go on and I'll talk about, um, you know, what precisely they're up to now and what the state of play is right now as regards their uh, online activity. And if I uh, uh, have some time, I also want to uh, dig in uh, a little bit uh, into uh, what's going on in terms of disruption. Um, of that online activity uh, and uh, say a few words about uh, future uh, trends. So in terms of what the problem uh, is, well, we've done some work, colleagues uh, and I in Voxpol have done some work. We used uh, both open source data on the one hand and some closed sourced uh, data uh, on the other hand, uh, both of which analyses uh, show that the internet, relatively unsurprisingly, I think uh, you'll agree, uh, is playing a role in contemporary violent extremism uh, and terrorism. And it's been playing an increasing role. So uh, the more the internet becomes embedded in our everyday lives, the more the internet plays a role in just about everything that we do, including uh, in the activities of violent extremists uh, and terrorists. A thing to, that's worth remembering, I think, in this regard is that it's not just about what people term radicalization. 
So I am going to focus today on radicalization issues, but that's not the only function of the internet and social media in contemporary extremism and terrorism. So, for example, uh, in our work, one of the things that we tried to do in our open source analysis was to disaggregate the various activities that people who were convicted of, of terrorism, what they had actually done online. And yes, some of them, um, the internet played a role in their radicalization to greater or lesser extents, but for many of them, they did other things online. For example, they did attack preparation online. They learned about different types of attacks online. They did sort of recon, if you like, online prior to attacks. So things that you might have had to do in a real-world setting previously, they just switched and used the internet uh, for these purposes. But like I said, what I want to talk about uh, today is Islamic State and really their sort of radicalization content or their radicalization activity uh, on the internet. So this is this idea, the, the problem for policymakers and others, uh, law enforcement, uh, etc., is that many people uh, believe that um, if you are exposed to a very large amount um, of violent extremist or terrorism content on the internet, and also if you begin to network around it uh, and that kind of thing, that it is possible for people who do that, not everybody certainly, but for a small numbers of people who become really immersed in that scene uh, to become violently radicalized as a result of that content consumption and that online networking uh, around uh, that uh, content. And so for me, I guess I think that Islamic State, IS, certainly uh, think that um, it's worth um, inputting fairly significant resources in terms of people, and time and money into the production of this content, into encouraging its circulation, etc. And I guess the question would be, okay, why would they have done that? Well, they've probably done that because they have the feeling that it has good outcomes for them. In other words, that it is fluence influencing uh, to some people in ways um, that have worked to their advantage. Uh, and I think we can probably see that in terms of uh, a couple of different things. Uh, number one, uh, encouraging people from Europe uh, and elsewhere in the Western world and indeed further afield to travel uh, and to engage in the conflict in Iraq and Syria on their part um, for uh, others to carry out attacks uh, in their home countries uh, or in third countries if they weren't uh, in a position uh, to travel. So the second uh, uh, thing that I wanted to talk about, like I said, is, okay, so what precisely were they doing online in their heyday? And their online heyday, I guess, is around 2014, uh, 2015. Uh, in tw June of 2014, they announced the establishment, or in their terms, the reestablishment of their so-called caliphate uh, in Iraq uh, and Syria. And that's when they uh, begin to term themselves IS, Islamic State. Uh, and at that time, like I say, they clearly had uh, thought pretty long and hard about uh, how they were going to use the internet uh, in this endeavor. And what they began to do, uh, like I say, 2014, at a high point in 2015, they were putting out a really high volume of content. So in mid-2015, it's been estimated that they were putting out somewhere between 800 and 1,100 items of content a month. It was actually largely, for people who are familiar with this, the photo montages. Uh, so that's the bulk of what they were putting out. But they would also uh, produce uh, a relatively large number of videos monthly, also audio, and also a whole variety of text uh, content. So um, it was very high volume, and it was diverse in terms of the types of content that was being produced uh, and being uh, disseminated. Also important uh, is that it was being produced in multiple uh, languages and it still is right up to uh, the present time. The largest part of it is in Arabic uh, language, but there's a whole multiplicity of other languages uh, that are being used and that content uh, is being produced in. So they produce official content in multiple languages, and also you get fan communities online who translate a lot of this content into other more obscure uh, languages. But the magazines, uh, for example, um, that they produce, and the one they're working on right now is called Rumia, which is Rome in Arabic. It's been produced monthly since the end of 2016, and that's put out there not just in Arabic, but in English, uh, in Turkish, in Russian, uh, in a host of other uh, languages too.
So it's high volume. In, in 2014, 2015, it was very high volume. Um, it was uh, multiple languages, and it was disseminated very widely by them excuse me, uh, across uh, many different uh, platforms. Uh, so uh, they were never, <laughs> despite what uh, we might have, the idea that we might have obtained from media and whatnot, they were never just uh, on Twitter or on Facebook or just reliant on the major social media uh, platforms. They've always had a reliance and a multiplicity um, of different uh, platforms. So yes, the major platforms, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc., but also a whole host of more obscure uh, platforms. In particular, um, an important node for quite some time has been an upload, a content upload uh, platform called Just Paste It. Um, the Internet Archive is another preferred platform of theirs, and really a whole host um, of, uh, of, of other uh, online spaces have been used uh, by them. In media, very often, uh, their content has been described as slick. That's, that's the, the, the most commonly used term uh, just to describe the content that's uh, been produced by IS. And that's really because of its very professional um, appearance. Uh, a lot of it has really quite uh, professional production values associated uh, with it. And uh, in particular, some of the uh, videos are um, quite impressive uh, as these things uh, go, if you like. Uh, I guess ones that are worth commenting upon, well, um, there's numerous uh, videos uh, in uh, 2015 that uh, contained aerial drone footage. Um, there's also, uh, if people are familiar with the al Qasasbe video, so that's the video where the Jordanian fighter pilot, who was called al Qasasbe, um, is burned uh, to death. That video is 22 minutes uh, long. It's interesting to watch. Uh, you can watch to about 18 uh, minutes um, without seeing uh, the burning. Um, but the interesting thing about that is the really professional uh, appearance of the graphics uh, in that video and the story that they're seeking to tell through the video and the animated graphics, uh, etc. Another interesting one uh, to look at uh, is the John Cantley series of videos. John Cantley is a British journalist uh, who was kidnapped by Islamic State uh, is being held by them, as far as we know, right up to uh, the present time. And he did a series um, of videos, um, I guess for them, in inverted uh, commas, uh, in which he appears to be reporting uh, from Mosul, from Raqqa, from various uh, places um, that were held by Islamic State at the time uh, when the videos were made. And the interesting thing about those is he is using what you might call a sort of a BBC accent. He's, he's speaking speaking in his BBC uh, accent and reporting precisely as if he was reporting for a major Western uh, outlet, uh, but on, on the part of IS. And that's probably, uh, uh, this is probably an opportune time to say something that's quite important. So a lot of the content that's been produced by IS over time and including in their heyday in 2014, 2015, is footage from the conflict is footage related to terrorism, etc. However, a not inconsiderable amount of that content um, has no uh, sort of violence component whatsoever. In fact, um, quite a lot of their content, even up to uh, the present time, but certainly in 2014, 2015, was focused on framing their activity as the building of a state, so as a state-building project. Um, uh, uh, their so-called caliphate, so portraying their so-called caliphate as, you know, a utopian state uh, for Muslims, that Muslims from all around the world uh, should travel to and where they would find a place that was welcoming, uh, etc. And they put an awful lot of effort into uh, portraying that uh, in their online uh, content. The other thing to say about a lot of the uh, content uh, in 2014, 2015 was that it was, it was clear from a lot of it that the people who were producing it were quite in tune with online youth cultures. So actually, a lot of the footage used in videos or in sort of memes or, or what have you that were produced and circulated are drawn from major Western um, movies, Hollywood movies, uh, for example, um, also from uh, computer games. So in particular, 
particular call of duty uh, is, is something that was drawn on quite uh, a lot. There's a lot of cat pictures, so we know that ultimately the internet is about cats, uh, and they did, uh, they did a lot of cat pictures. So you would see these young fellas um, with guns or grenades or what have you, and a kitten, uh, and there's some well-known ones with uh, bunny rabbits and little fawns uh, and this kind of thing uh, also. Um, there's a lot of selfies. Uh, that, were, uh, that were produced and circulated uh, by them. So very in tune with uh, what was going on with young people, what was going on online, so kind of an online uh, youth culture. Again, it's relatively unsurprising because what we're talking about, of course, is a bunch of young people who are in touch with online uh, youth uh, culture. And then uh, I have to say that very important in 2014, 2015, from a radicalization perspective, I think, was that people who engaged online um, with IS, it was possible at that time for you relatively easily to be in touch with fighters on the ground in Iraq and Syria, actual members um, of IS. And, for example, um, young people in the UK and in other European countries certainly had the opportunity to be in touch with, for example, some of the UK fighters, French uh, youth with French fighters, some of the Dutch with Dutch fighters, uh, etc. And I don't think uh, uh, that that can, uh, should be underestimated in terms, again, of that kind of um, influence, uh, influencing activity uh, and what have you. So basically, um, excuse me, so basically what you had uh, uh, as a result of all of what I've just described, is that in 2014, 2015, they really did have a strong, vibrant online community. In particular, on Twitter, but also on other major social media platforms like Facebook and elsewhere. So all told... Um, what they had, what they provided for people who were interested, um, individual users who had an interest, was this quite immersive uh, online experience. You could spend all your time, if you wished, um, uh, at that point, um, interacting with and around IS uh, content, um, etc. So what does, uh, what, what was the purpose, I guess, of all of this, or what, what were the outcomes? Well, like I said, um, Really, um, what a lot of this content did, so this very high volume that they um, spread very widely in multiple languages, etc., what did it do? Well, it glamorized the Syria conflict, uh, certainly, um, especially, I would say, suicide attacks or, or the, the fight um, more generally. It also, like I said, um, a lot of that content was exalting the virtues of the Islamic State, indeed portraying it as a utopia uh, uh, for Muslims, especially those uh, in the West and elsewhere. It, they did two things, I guess, uh, in particular. They said, if you um, are in a position to travel to Syria, to their so-called caliphate, well then, it was absolutely your duty to do so. That was the first thing that they said. And this is the so-called foreign fighter phenomenon. We know um, that uh, various um, people um, from various uh, Western countries, in particular some European uh, countries, uh, took up this call and traveled uh, to Syria and to Iraq to join IS. But they said, if you can't uh, do that, uh, well then uh, carry out an attack on our behalf uh, in your home country or in some uh, third uh, country, and we also know that this um, appears to have had uh, an impact uh, also. And they did uh, provide uh, online practical instructions on how to carry out um, both those activities. So there was quite a lot of instruction online in 2014, 2015 about how precisely you could travel to Syria, to go to Turkey, how to cross the border, what to bring with you, etc., etc. And then there is uh, also online, right up to the present time, in Instructions. So if you can't uh, travel and you want to carry out an, uh, an attack in your home or a third country, well then here are some ideas about what kinds of an attack you can car should carry out, what the targets could be, uh, etc. So basically I would say that there are two things that were really, really important here. None of this could really happen, or it certainly could not have the level of successfulness uh, that it's had in terms of an online uh, violence uh, strategy, if you like, without the conflict context. So there is a horrendous uh, conflict ongoing uh, in Syria and Iraq, and that's absolutely crucial, uh, obviously, to this, as is the setting up of the so-called caliphate. So they had something to sell. It was something very specific. It has tangibility. It's real. 
uh, and that was their, their state or their caliphate. But the technology context is, I think, uh, important because once upon a time, in the absence of social media, you could certainly try and sell your caliphate or what have you, but I don't think you would have the same level um, of successfulness. Um, so really, what they did was they provided, for people who were interested, uh, this immersive online experience where, like I already mentioned, in 2014, 2015, maybe uh, uh, even after, um, it was possible for people to be drawn into this online world, this online IS uh, world, uh, and to become even major players uh, in that world through your online activity. Uh, and some of those people uh, then decided that they would actually take real-world uh, actions of uh, different varieties, uh, as I've described. That was then, this is now. So things are somewhat different uh, at the present time. And there is a real world aspect to the difference and there is an online aspect uh, to the difference. So number one in terms of the real world. IS are under pressure in the physical world at the present time. Um, there's, conf there's conflict raging. It's a very hot conflict right now in Iraq uh, and in Syria. They need more people to fight because they are under significant uh, pressure uh, in those uh, territories. They uh, have also lost an enormous amount of territory that was once held by them. What that means is that they have much fewer safe spaces, if you like, in which to do their media activity uh, and their online content production and what have you. But also... Um, their social media operators and producers, uh, particularly people high up within the media um, portions uh, of the organization, have been directly targeted. The most prominent person who was killed um, was a guy called Al Adnani, who was killed at the end, very end of August in 2016. But other people have clearly been targeted before and after, uh, and it was because of their involvement uh, in precisely in this uh, media activity. Their cyber infrastructures were also targeted. So in addition to actually um, targeted assassinations, uh, if you like, there was also targeting of their critical infrastructures in various hacking uh, activity uh, and whatnot. So what you do get is a fairly significant decline in output. It begins um, around July, uh, August uh, 2016. And uh, Charlie Winter has surmised that by the end of 2017, they were down in any given month month, about 36%. Uh, so in February 2017, um, they produced approximately 570 items of content. But you'll recall, um, in approximately June um, of 2015, they were up at around, let's call it, 900 items uh, or there or thereabouts. So that's, that's uh, the real world uh, kicking in, in terms of the supply side issues, right? The, the actual production um, of the content. But there's also... Um, uh, disruption uh, taking place online also. So um, Twitter in particular have really engaged um, at a very li high level uh, in terms of disrupting IS uh, on their platform. So uh, at one time, it was perfectly possible uh, to go on to Twitter and very easily and very quickly find very large amounts of IS um, fan accounts and IS uh, uh, propaganda and what have you. That's really no longer the case. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, findings from an analysis that shows that mm, approximately 80% of IS-related uh, Twitter uh, accounts um, are taken down um, within 100 days. Now, that may sound long, but actually um, uh, an awful lot of them are taken down an awful lot uh, faster than that. And in fact, many, many um, really explicitly um, IS accounts, so for example, those that are tweeting links to official IS propaganda will be taken down generally in minutes hours or days, not uh, weeks um, or months uh, at the present uh, time. And this has really seriously impacted the community uh, that I uh, talked about. So what you'll see there on the bottom of the screen is how many, what's the average number of followers at the present time for an IS Twitter account? 14. And here's to give you an idea. What's the, what's the average number of followers for other jihadi accounts? So we were doing a comparison in this research between um, IS uh, 
uh, fan accounts and other jihadi accounts. So, for example, those belonging to the Taliban um, or al-Shabaab or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, who are al-Qaeda uh, in Iraq uh, and Syria. And you'll see that they're averaging a, a much uh, higher number um, of followers, even though they're under a small amount of disruption uh, also. So, like I said, what this basically means is that uh, the community is gone. The community is all but gone from Twitter. Um, and in particular, the IS community is all but on from Twitter. And uh, an interesting way, I think, to illustrate this, if you like, is to show that, okay, on the uh, left-hand side of your screen uh, there, what we're seeing is some typical screen names um, from 2014, 2015, and some typical avatar images, profile pictures uh, that were used at that time. And for anybody who knew this scene, the IS online scene, this was a way to really easily and really quickly identify Identify ideological fellow travelers uh, online. These are really, really obvious uh, signals uh, to people who might uh, have shared uh, your views or what have you, or to researchers uh, obviously looking for um, data uh, and whatnot. So the avatar images are of prominent people from within uh, the Islamic State. So the, the, the one with the yellow background there, for example, is al-Baghdadi, the so-called caliph. Uh, the third one over is al-Adnani, uh, the media guy uh, that I've been uh, talking about. You see in the, in the middle bottom there is the so-called IS uh, flag, the black and white logo, uh, and then uh, the flag being held by green birds, and green birds are often a symbol of, of martyrdom associated with suicide attackers and that kind of thing. And then you see on the right of the screen what things look like right now, and basically what you have is these screen names that are meaningless. Um, and uh, these are uh, generally screen names, a lot of them, of sort of throwaway accounts that are just being used to, um, you know, to throw URLs and links out there uh, and, and leave them up for as long as possible, but generally only a really short time because uh, Twitter delete these uh, accounts really very fast. Uh, and then the avatar images again are the so-called Twitter egg or other very innocuous images. And you can't really maintain a community uh, in the face of this level uh, of disruption because you do need some way to signal to uh, other people, you know, where you stand, uh, etc. So the community is, is pretty much gone uh, from uh, Twitter at the present time. So where is the community now? Because it, it's not gone from the internet. This is an important thing uh, to point out. So basically right now they're on Telegram. Uh, probably nobody in the room, maybe some people here, but <laughs> probably nobody in the room is familiar with Telegram. And so <laughs> this is, oh, yes. yeah, <laughs> this is an interesting one. So yeah, so Facebook, I guess, has about 2 billion uh, users. Uh, Telegram has considerably less users. Having said that, they are growing uh, all the time. It has considerably less users, too, uh, than Twitter. Um, it, it's growing. Um, and uh, it, it's growing uh, at quite a significant rate. But nonetheless, it doesn't have uh, the kind of, I guess, brand awareness even uh, that some of these other major social media outlets have. What it does have, however, is end-to-end -end encryption. And this is a thing that's very much focused upon uh, in uh, analyses, in media, uh, etc. Uh, also, law enforcement uh, agencies are quite concerned with this issue. Um, and we, we can talk about this later, the role of d direct messaging, and so encrypted messaging, etc., in, for example, contemporary terrorist attacks, particular, in particular lone actor attacks. But... One-on-one -on -one contacts don't work generally or wholly um, well for radicalization purposes. If you want to get your content out there really widely in order to influence or seek to influence as, as many people as possible, one-to-one -one contacts don't work. What you need is many-to-many -many or one-to-many uh, contacts. And it is possible to do this uh, on Telegram, but not as well as, as it was possible to do so on, for example, uh, Twitter, which is a much more public uh, platform. Having said that, there are 5,000 member uh, groups um, that it's possible to join uh, on Telegram, uh, and it is very powerful in terms of you being able to upload very large files onto the platform itself, so into their cloud. When I said that Twitter was disrupting um, accounts, deleting accounts from their platform, it didn't only disrupt the Twitter sphere, as it were, it disrupted things much more widely because people generally link from Twitter 
to other online spaces because of the nature of Twitter. You only have 140 uh, characters. Uh, so there, there will be a lot of linking from Twitter. And when Twitter deletes accounts, they're thereby deleting all the links to the other platforms. And the other platforms are oftentimes content upload sites. They're not media, uh, social media uh, spaces uh, per se. So you disrupt, if you see uh, large parts of the network, when, when Twitter disrupts the accounts on Telegram, it's possible to upload all your content into their cloud. So unless Telegram uh, deletes um, the actual uh, groups and channels, uh, the content stays there uh, for the duration. Telegram are doing uh, some disruption, so some deletion um, of accounts, but nothing to the extent um, of what Twitter and some of the other major social media platforms um, have been doing. Just in terms of finishing uh, up, I guess it's difficult to say uh, where things are going here. And it's difficult to say for two reasons. Number one, things are very fast changing in the physical world around violent jihadism and the activities of IS uh, in particular. But also the internet is a very, very fast changing uh, realm. And so when you put those two things together, it's really a high level of difficulty uh, to, to get it right, uh, if you like, about what the future holds. I guess what I would say is two things. Number one is this. Uh, um, I, I do think that we will see a continuing role for um, these messaging uh, applications. And that's for two reasons. Number one, they're increasingly used by all of us in the real world. Thereby, they will also be increasingly used uh, by jihadis and other varieties of violent uh, extremists. But also, number two, we can see that they are being used for one-on-one -on -one contacts between, for example, um, IS... Um, uh, operators, if you like, who are in Iraq and Syria and are using them to be in contact with people that they have on the ground uh, in attacks, who are about to carry out attacks in various European countries uh, and elsewhere. And then, secondly, in terms of future trends, I've thought for some time uh, that uh, a live stream is a possibility. Um, I think that uh, live streaming, well, it's definitely the case, it's a fact, that live streaming really took off uh, in 2016. Uh, the use of Periscope, which is Twitter's live streaming uh, capacity, and in particular Facebook Live, uh, is, uh, are, are things that really saw a massive uh, increase. And in particular, are, are including in, if you like, um, various kind of uh, violence events uh, that took place, including large-scale sort of violence events like the coup in Turkey, uh, for example, and also small-scale um, violence events, so various uh, sort of hate attacks and um, also, unfortunately, people you know, committing suicide uh, and, and this kind of thing. So all of those things have been live-streamed in 2016 and 2017. There is some likelihood, I think, that some violent extremist or terrorist attack uh, is likely to be live-streamed uh, at some point. And again, it just goes back to my point about, you know, violent extremists and terrorists, a lot of them are young people, they've grown up with the internet, they use the internet in similar ways to how other people use the internet, but in this particular violent extremism and terrorism context, we see a shift to social media on the part of IS and others because social media came to be the place to be, the place the, where or how you would do the internet. Um, we see a shift to messaging apps for the same reason, so these are structural factors, if you like, and so for that reason, um, I, I think uh, live streaming, if it can, continues to, to take off and to build in the way that it has, uh, is likely uh, to be used. We, we can talk about uh, that maybe in some uh, more detail um, in the Q&A if people are interested uh, in that. But, but those are the, I guess, the, the kind of things that we're talking about now. So if I was finishing up uh, right now, I guess what I would say is this, that uh, IS had their high point uh, to date, uh, in terms of their online activity, probably in 2014 at uh, 2015. They are under pressure now in the real world and in an online setting. Uh, with regard to online in particular, they're being disrupted uh, by the major social media uh, companies to a very considerable extent. They also have let, they're producing less content, so there's less content uh, in circulation. If you're somebody who believes that, um, you know, 
uh, accessing this content, consuming this content, and networking around this content can be influencing and can cause young people in particular to become violently radicalized, well then the downturn in terms of production and the disruption by the social media companies is a positive thing. But they haven't given up. They know that their online activity uh, had uh, impacts um, in terms of the real world, their real world settings. Uh, and so while uh, their community is gone uh, from Twitter uh, and from some other uh, major social media platforms, what they are doing right now is sort of casting round for other, you know, uh, lower level, more obscure online spaces and uh, beginning uh, to use those. Uh, so, and there's always the possibility that they can sort of um, erupt online uh, in, in some uh, specific setting, like around some specific attack or what have you, with a live stream uh, or something similar. I'll leave it there. This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs. Join the discussion on IIEA.com and access our engaging videos, blogs and podcasts.